express first my sincere thanks to Party Secretary General Chang Gaoli and to Mayor Zhuang, as well as Vice Mayor John and the entire Summer Davos Organizing Committee under the responsibility of Zhu Cheng. But I would like to thank also particularly to the people of Tianjin and the over 2,000 volunteers who make this meeting particularly enjoyable. I want to thank you for your efficient partnership, the great hospitality, and the warm welcome. It is a great honor and privilege to return to Tianjin with the annual meeting of the new champions. And it is very impressive to be here today in this newly constructed Mei Chang Congress Center, which in some way symbolizes a gate to the new world. I want to share with you that this building, based on the efforts of our hosts, was created in less than nine months, and that it reflects in a great way in all its aspects environmental responsibility. I would also like to greet my fellow Foundation Board members of the World Economic Forum, Peter Brabeck, Victor Chu, Chu Min, Chu Schöndorf, the Chairman of our International Business Council, Sir Martin Sorrell, and all the members of these councils, as well as the CEOs and representatives of our partner and member companies. And I would like to greet particularly the new champions here. You are the heart of the Summer Davos, and you represent its innovative and its entrepreneurial spirit. And I would like, when I mention you, just to stand up to show the world how much entrepreneurial innovative spirit, how many new champions are among us. So first, you, the representatives of the global growth companies, please stand up. You, the tech pioneers, please stand also up. You, the young global leaders, please get up. You, the social entrepreneurs, please get up. You, the young scientists, and you, the representatives of the new champion cities. All the challenges on the global agenda require new thinking, new ideas. In short, they require the new champions. Mayor Zhuang and dear friends, Tianjin, as we witness from the developments over the last two years, serves itself as a role model as a new champion, particularly by creating a promising future with strongly cultivated historical roots and finding a harmonious combination of fast economic progress and as well as environmental and social responsibility. Thank you again all here for your engagement, for your enthusiasm, which will prevail over the next 48 hours and which certainly will characterize 
this meeting. Thank you all from Tianjin for your friendship and your hospitality, and please greet Mayor Zhuang. Your Excellency, Chairman Shuang, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The world-renowned Sama Davos is now in Tianjin, making the new champion city once again the focus of the worldwide attention. On behalf of Mr. Zhao Gao, Zhang Gao Li, Party Secretary of Tianjin City and member of the Politburo of CPPCC, and on behalf of the Tianjin Municipal Government and 13 million Tianjin people, I wish to extend my sincere welcome to all of you and extend my warmest congratulations on the successful opening of the forum. The forum takes place at the 40th anniversary of the World Economic Forum, and the forum takes place at a critical moment after the international financial crisis, which gives it an important significance. The theme of the forum is to drive growth through sustainability. The forum is intended to seek correct solutions which will have a profound impact on the healthy development of the global economy. Here I wish to extend my sincere gratitude to His Excellency Chairman Schwab. Thank him for his high-level trust on Tianjin and his outstanding contribution to the success of this forum. I also wish to thank NDRC the Foreign Ministry and other governmental departments and all the participants here for your contribution. In the past two years, the world economy has gone through the most severe challenge after the Greater Depression in the last century. China has demonstrated its commitment and wisdom in its response to the international financial crisis which has been well recognized by the international community. Tianjin is the economic center in northern China. Tianjin has been committed to delivering natural, national economic policy and to overcome the impacts of the international financial crisis. Tianjin has leveraged on high-tech industry, technical innovation, deeper structural reform and has succeeded in maintaining a robust economic growth. In the past two years, Tianjin has been growing by 16.5% on an annual basis. In the first eight months of this year, it grew by 18%. At the same time, Tianjin has been leading in the country in areas of energy efficiency, CO2 emission reduction, etc. The worldwide financial crisis has caused evident changes in the world economic stage. The architecture of development is undergoing profound changes. In front of us is a historic transformation. Since its entry into the industrial society, the mankind is creating a vast material wealth. However, at the same time, it has paid enormous resource and environmental costs. The traditional model of economic development can hardly work. Although the international financial crisis still has its impacts, green economy is booming and low carbon technology is becoming the motive behind the world economic recovery and sustainable development. As a fast growing new champion city, 
Tianjin will continue to put people's interests first and develop a balanced and sustainable development approach. Tianjin will be further committed to changing its model of economic development, improve its economic structure, facilitate economic growth through an environmental way, and apply resource efficiency and environmental protection to all areas of economic development. And as a result, Tianjin aims to deliver a scientific development model in its real sense. Ladies and gentlemen, sustainable growth is a common topic in front of us and a joint responsibility for the mankind. Let us join hands, respond to the needs of the times, seize the opportunities of the times, enhance mutual understanding and cooperation, and contribute our wisdom and efforts to a better future. As a host, we are dedicated to do everything we can to make this forum an international event that has its own features, diversified contents, and good recognition. Last but not least, let me wish the 2010 Summer Davos complete success and all of you a pleasant stay in Tianjin. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. The premier is coming in one minute. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Premier of the People's Republic of China, His Excellency Wen Jiabao. 女士们、先生们，请欢迎中华人民共和国国务院总理温家宝阁下入场。Your Excellency, Premier Wen Chabao, distinguished heads of state, distinguished participants from governments and international organizations, business, civil society, academia, science, culture, as well as the media. Dear members, of the World Economic Forum, dear friends. It is indeed a great honor and my very personal pleasure to welcome back His Excellency Wen Chabao, Premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China here in Tianjin. 
by the way, your hometown at the fourth annual meeting of the new champions. Under your patronage, Premier, you were at the origin of this meeting, we have built, together with our partners, the hosting cities, Tianjin this year, the National Development and Reform Commission, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other ministries, we have built the Summer Davos into the true global meeting place of the new champions, those exemplary organizations and individuals who construct the world of tomorrow by pioneering new scientific, technological, and business solutions. The annual meeting of the new champions is a powerful reflection of the stakeholder concept which is at the base of the World Economic Forum since 40 years to foster cooperation and partnerships among all leaders of global society to create a better world, a more sustainable world, and a more socially inclusive world. We all know, Premier Wen, how much you personally and how much the Chinese leadership is committed to the mission and the task of sustainable growth. Therefore, we, the over 1,500 people in this hall, coming from over 85 countries, we will be proud if during this meeting of the new champions, we can make a substantial contribution to provide the world with the mindset, the policies, the ideas, the solutions for a fundamentally new era of economic growth. A new era, a true post-crisis era, which builds on the harmonious integration of addressing societal challenges into development models, particularly also business and economic development models. What we need and what we stand for in this room is the true spirit of innovation, of transformation, of entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurship always serving society, the global public interest. Entrepreneurship creating wealth and jobs, but at the same time creating equity and justice as well as taking care in our environmental affairs of our responsibility towards future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His Excellency Wen Chabao, Premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China. Professor Klaus Schwab, Executive Chairman of the World Economic Forum. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin 
by extending congratulations on the opening of the fourth annual meeting of the new champions, the Summer Davos, and a welcome to you all. At the crucial juncture, when the world economy is slowly recovering, the meeting will explore the way forward for future development under the theme of driving growth through sustainability. This is highly relevant and significant, and I wish the meeting full success. The past two years have seen China emerge as one of the first countries to achieve an economic rebound and maintain steady and relatively fast economic development under extremely difficult and complex circumstances. We owe our achievements to the comprehensive implementation of the stimulus package. At the height of the international financial crisis, China's economic growth rate dropped by a big margin. Many enterprises completely or partially suspended operations, and some even closed down. Many workers lost their jobs, and a large number of rural migrant workers had to return to their home villages. In view of this, we acted immediately to introduce a stimulus package. From the second quarter of 2009, the downward trend in economic growth was quickly reversed. The economy grew by 9.1% in 2009 and 11.1% in the first half of 2010. Urban employment has kept expanding, people's income has been increasing, and social stability and harmony has been maintained. As the Chinese saying goes, one would never fully appreciate the difficulty unless he has experienced it in person. For a country like China with 1.3 billion people, without a certain rate of economic growth, full employment and people's well-being can only be empty talk. The stimulus package has enabled us to not only maintain the current economic growth and social stability, but also, and more importantly, secure the sound momentum of economic development. The severe external shock did not cause a big fluctuation in China's modernization process. This is of major and far-reaching significance. In tackling the international financial crisis, we have always given top priority to transforming the economic development pattern and restructuring the economy. In the past two years, domestic demand, consumption in particular, has played an increasingly strong role in driving economic growth. Total retail sales in 2009 rose by 16.9% in real terms, the fastest since 1986. This good momentum is continuing, and the retail sales in the first half of this year grew at roughly the same rate as the same period of last year. The upgrading of the industrial structure has been accelerated. In the first seven months of this year, the value added of high-tech industries increased by 17.7% year-on-year, 0.7 percentage point higher than that of the industries above a designated level. Infrastructure development has been strengthened. On the 1st of August 2008, the Beijing-Tianjin Intercity Railway, China's first top-class high-speed rail with full intellectual property, was put into operation. Shortening the travel time between Beijing and Tianjin to only 30 minutes and binding the two major municipalities as one. The Wuhan Guangzhou High Speed Railway that went into operation on the 26th December 2009 set the world record of the longest and fastest high-speed railway completed on a non-interrupted basis. 
solid progress has been made in energy conservation, emissions reduction, and environmental protection. Last year, we shut down small thermal power plants with a total capacity of 26.17 million kilowatts and phased out inefficient production capacity of 16.91 million tons of steel, 21.13 million tons of iron, and 74.16 million tons of cement. By the end of this month, we will have eliminated an additional amount of inefficient production capacity, including 8.25 million tons of steel, 30 million tons of iron, and 91.55 million tons of cement. Energy consumption per unit of GDP has been reduced by 15.6% in the first four years of the 11th five-year plan period. Regional development has been more coordinated. In 2009, the growth rates of value added of industries above a designated scale in the central and the western regions were 1.1 and 4.5 percentage points higher than the national average, respectively. In the first half of this year, such growth in the central region was 3.1 percentage points higher than the national average and that in the western region on the par with the national average. Also in the first half of this year, the central and the western region's contribution to the value added of industries above a designated level in the national total increased to 38.8% from 38.1% of the same period in 2008. What is more important is that we have made all round arrangements for accelerating the transformation of economic development pattern and economic restructuring from a macro and strategic perspective. All these will give a strong boost to the stable and healthy development of China's economy in the long run. We have implemented a proactive fiscal policy and a moderately easy monetary policy with a non-precedented intensity and at the same time successfully kept fiscal and financial risks under control. In the past two years, China's budget deficit and government debt have been kept below 3% and around 20% of the GDP respectively. The asset quality of banks and their ability to fend off risks have improved. The capital adequacy ratio and NPL ratio now stand at 11.1% and 2.8% respectively, both in the safe territory. This being said, we are keenly aware of the latent fiscal and financial risks, especially the debt risks of the financing platforms of local governments. This is not a new problem, yet the risks have somewhat increased in recent months. We have formulated the measures to strengthen the regulation of those financing platforms and implementation is well underway. In the face of the sudden international financial crisis, the extraordinary policy measures that we have adopted are necessary. And these measures have played a positive role, yet some negative impacts are hardly avoidable. What's important is to keep those negative impacts within the scope that we can manage. In this sense, we have done a good job in balancing the need of promoting positive effects with that of reducing negative ones. Taken as a whole, the results of our stimulus package are good. By implementing the stimulus package, we have not only maintained China's economic stability and relatively fast economic growth, but also made important contribution to the world economic recovery. At a time of negative economic growth for major developed countries, the fast economic stabilization and rapid economic growth of China and other major developing countries greatly boosted international confidence in overcoming the financial crisis and provided a strong impetus to the world economic growth. 
in 2009, China's imports totaled 1.0056 trillion US dollars, and its trade surplus dropped by 102 billion US dollars. In the first seven months of this month, China's imports reached 766.6 billion US dollars, a surge of 47.2% year on year, and the trade surplus was reduced by 22.6 billion US dollars year on year. This shows that China's economic growth has provided major development opportunities for the multinationals and created huge demand for major economies and neighboring countries. It has become an important engine for the world economic recovery. To sum up, from both the near and long-term perspectives and in both the world economy and the fiscal and financial field, our stimulus package, policies and measures are timely, forceful, effective and suited to China's realities. They are the right choice that will bring benefits to both the current and future generations and serve the interests of the world. China's economy is now in good shape, featuring fast growth, gradual structural improvement, rising employment and basic price stability. Growth of some major economic indicators moderated in the second quarter of this year. This is mainly due to the high level of the, basic, the base figures and our proactive macro control measures. We have the confidence, conditions, and capabilities to maintain steady and fast economic development. In, exercise, in exercising macro control, we will take it as a central task to appropriately handle the relationship between maintaining steady and rapid economic development, adjusting the economic structure, and managing inflation expectations, and we will take policy stability as the main focus. While maintaining the continuity and stability of our policies, we will make micro-control measures more targeted and flexible to consolidate and strengthen the sound momentum of development. Ladies and gentlemen, the underlying impact of the international financial crisis has not been fully eliminated. The world economy has yet to enter a benign cycle of steady growth and systemic and cultural risks are still prominent. We need to cement and build on what we have achieved in countering the financial crisis. We need to take into consideration both the immediate needs and long-term development, and while continuing to energize the recovery, create conditions for sustainable development through structural reform. This is a common task for all countries. In the case of China, there is a lack of balance, coordination, and sustainability in the economic development. The main problems include the unreasonable economic structure, weak capabilities for scientific and technological innovation, rising resources and environmental constraints, uneven urban, rural, and regional development, and lack of coordination between economic and social development. Some of these problems are inescapable in our current stage of economic development, and some are caused by inadequate institutional reform. To effectively address these deep-seated and structural problems, we will take an integrated approach that balances near-term macro control with long-term development and advances reform and, uh, and opening up in a broader context of scientific development, 
Only in this way can the Chinese economy achieve greater and more sustainable development. For now and in the time to come, we will focus our efforts in the following fields. We will pursue balanced growth of domestic and external demand and establish a long-term mechanism to expand domestic demand, consumer demand in particular. The Chinese market is one with the largest potential in the world. To fully tap the potential and effectively unleash the domestic demand holds the key to long-term and steady development of China's economy and represents an important means to meet the prominent challenges in the economy. We will speed up the reform of the income distribution system and raise the proportion of individual income in the na national income and the proportion of the primary distribution that goes to wages and salaries. We will create conditions for more people to earn income from property, reverse the trend of widening income gap as quickly as possible, and boost the sustainable growth of people's income and consumer spending. We will, with a commitment to coordinated development between urban and rural areas and between different regions, we will take active and prudent steps to advance urbanization and allow eligible rural migrant workers to gradually become urban residents in line with the local conditions. We will accelerate the building of the new countryside and improve rural infrastructure and public services. We will continue to implement the overall strategy for regional development, push forward the development of the Western region and the reinvigoration of the old industrial bases in Northeast China and other places, energize the development of the central region, cultivate new drivers for domestic demand, and open up new space for the growth of domestic demand in rural areas and central and Western regions. At the same time, we will continue to make full use of both the international and domestic markets. China's economy is an open economy, and China is both a major exporter and a major importer. We do not pursue surplus in foreign trade. China runs a trade surplus with the United States and Europe, yet a trade deficit with Japan and the ROK. We have a surplus in the processing trade, yet a deficit in general trade. Our export growth is rapidly recovering, yet our import has grown even faster. We cannot and will not pursue development with our door closed. We will expand domestic demand at the, at the same time actively stabilize and expand external demand and strive to achieve balanced development of domestic and external demand. We will spur economic development through innovation and promote scientific and technological advances and upgrading of the industrial structure. This is a strategic priority if we are to fundamentally ease the resources and environmental constraints adapt ourselves to the adjustments in the international demand structure and new changes brought by the upgrading of domestic consumption, raise the quality and efficiency of our economic development and national competitiveness across the board and promote sustainable economic development. We will integrate our efforts in strengthening the capacity for scientific and technological innovation with those for improving the modern industrial system. We will upgrade the traditional industries with advanced technologies, nurture a number of internationally competitive enterprises with their own intellectual property and well-known brands, 
and build a number of world-class modern industry clusters which can serve as growth drivers so that China can move from a big manufacturing country to a strong manufacturing country. We will firmly grasp the new trend in future scientific and technological advancement, provide stronger policy support and planning guidance, actively build the emerging industries with strategic importance, develop new pillar industries at a faster pace, and strive for leapfrog development. We will accelerate the opening up of the service industry, both domestically and externally, foster an enabling policy and institutional environment for its development and increase its proportion in the national economy. We will continue to conserve resources and protect the environment and raise the efficiency in resources utilization and capacity in tackling climate change. To conserve resources and protect the environment is China's basic state policy we must accelerate the formation of an industrial structure, production model, and consumption pattern that are conducive to energy and resources conservation and eco-protection to promote harmony between man and nature. We will further improve laws and standards, strengthen accountability evaluation in meeting environmental targets, and advance the development of circular economy we will make all-round efforts to save energy, water, land and materials and make comprehensive use of all kinds of resources, enhance the conservation and management of all nat natural resources and take a holistic approach to protect and repair the eco-environment. We will energetically develop low-carbon industrial construction and transport systems, increase the forest carbon sink, and speed up the R&D demonstration and industrial application of low carbon technologies. We will comprehensively enhance our capacity for tackling climate change and actively carry out international cooperation against climate change under the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. We will strike a balance between economic and social development and strive to ensure and improve people's livelihood and promote social equity and justice. To improve people's livelihood and extend the benefits of economic development to all is the fundamental goal of economic and social development. And to meet the essential needs of the people and free them from worries for daily necessities is an important responsibility of modern government. Many countries now face the challenge of high unemployment. China is also confronted by a rather severe employment situation. There are almost 800 million people of working age in China, equivalent to the workforce of all developed countries combined. The annual increase of workforce in the job market far exceeds the number of jobs available. The oversupply of labor and structural labor shortage exist side by side. We will make employment expansion a priority target in economic and social development, implement a more proactive employment policy, vigorously create new jobs and encourage self-employment to promote full employment. We will enhance the government's capability in providing public services, gradually establish a fairly complete and sustainable system of basic public services that covers both urban and rural areas and promote equal access to social security and basic medical and healthcare services. The issue of housing is both an economic issue and more importantly, a major issue affecting people's livelihood and social stability. To stabilize the housing price and ensure housing availability is an important responsibility of governments at all levels. We must further rectify 
the market order, improve the land, tax and financial policies, accelerate the establishment of a long-term mechanism for the healthy development of the housing market and curb investment and speculative demand. We need to guide the market towards greater supply of ordinary commercial housing, speed up the development of low-income housing, and build public rental housing in order to form a rational structure of housing supply and meet the diverse housing needs. We will deepen reform and increase the dynamism and vitality for sustainable development. China's development and progress would not have been possible without reform and opening up. And to achieve the modernization goal of building a prosperous, democratic, culturally advanced, and harmonious country, we still need to rely on reform and opening up. With China's reform endeavor at a crucial stage, we must advance the reforms in all areas with greater determination and courage. We must deepen comprehensive reforms in the economic, political, and other fields to enable the entire system to better meet the needs of developing a modern economy and building socialist democracy, push forward social equity and justice, and facilitate the free and all-round development of the people. Ladies and gentlemen, China's development is open development. China's opening up is long-term, comprehensive, and mutually beneficial. We will uphold all policies conducive to opening up. China is committed to creating an open and fair environment for foreign invested enterprises. China gives high priority to intellectual property protection and has already made this a national strategy. We are ready to conduct exchanges and dialogue with other countries in this field. I wish to reiterate here that all enterprises registered in China according to Chinese laws are Chinese enterprises. Their products are made in China products. And the innovative products based on their research and development are created in China products. All foreign invested enterprises registered in China enjoy national treatment. In government procurement, China gives equal treatment to all products produced in China by foreign invested enterprises and Chinese invested enterprises alike. China's huge market volume, sound infrastructure, strong industrial support ability, and stable and fair market environment are attracting more and more multinational enterprises to invest and establish business in China. China is now one of the world's largest foreign investment destinations. More than 470 of the top 500 global companies have established their presence in China. By July this year, China had received 1.05 trillion US dollars of foreign investment in cumulative terms, ranking the first among developing countries for 18 years in a row. In the first seven months this year, Foreign investment in China increased by 20.7% over the same period last year. Foreign invested enterprises on the whole enjoy good operation in China and have reaped good returns. 
many have become the bright spot and profit center in the global business growth of their parent companies. All of these demonstrate that the efforts of the Chinese government to foster a favorable inv investment environment have been recognized by investors and boasted foreign investors' confidence. We will continue to improve the foreign-related economic laws, regulations and policies and improve the business environment for foreign investors in China. We sincerely welcome enterprises from all countries to actively participate in China's reform and opening up process and hope that all types of enterprises will strictly abide by Chinese laws and regulations, run businesses in China according to law, and share the opportunities and benefits of China's prosperity and progress. Thank you. Mr. Premier, first, I think we should thank you because in your speech you have given us a kind of outline of the forthcoming 12th five-year plan by describing all the different objectives which you have in mind. I also should thank you because I think through the balanced and vigorous Chinese policies, you have contributed very much to avoid that the world in general has had just a downhill run. You have shown great responsibility towards the world and, Mr. Premier, I think the chief executive officers of the large multinational companies sitting here in this room have particularly appreciated your last remarks about the role of the multinational companies and how much they are welcomed and how much they can also in the future contribute out of the partnership contribute to the development of China and profit in the mutual interest from their profit from their presence here in China. I would like to ask you one question. When you look at the five years plan and you have mentioned, Mr. Premier, some industries which uh, China particularly would like to develop. Could you give us more indication about those industries which are in your mind for particular fast-track future development? First, 全面阐述中国政府经济发展的各项目标、政策和措施，为我们描绘了一幅中国“十二五”规划的蓝图。中国政府所采取的平衡和有力的经济发展措施，帮助世界经济避免进入大幅下滑的恶性循环。中国在应
，我们正在制定“十二五”规划。在“十二五”规划中，我们提出了优先发展的产业。如果从大的方面讲，首先是要促进一二三产业的平衡发展。第二，就是在加快推进工业化和城镇化的进程中，要重视和加强农业，努力实现。农业的现代化，在工业产业当中，我们特别重视与人口、资源、环境有关的产业和节能环保产业。因此，我们提出要把节能环保、啊信息技术、高端制造、航天航空作为战略新兴的产业。与此同时，我们要加大现代服务业的发展，特别是与生产相关的服务业。谢谢。We are formulating the 12th five-year plan. In the course of the formulation, we have identified a number of priority sectors and fields. From a macro perspective, we are committed to promoting balanced development of the primary, the secondary, and tertiary industries in the Chinese economy. Secondly, while accelerating China's industrialization and urbanization, we will continue to give high priority to and strengthen agricultural development to build a modernized agriculture in China. In the course of industrial development, we pay very high attention to the development of industries connected with population, resources, and the environment. We will continue to pay high attention to the development of the energy-saving and environment-friendly industries. We have identified a number of industries as emerging industries with strategic significance, including energy conservation, environmental protection, information technology, high-end manufacturing and aerospace and others. At the same time, we will advance the development of modern service sector, in particular services linked with production. Thank you. Premier Wen Chabao, I would like to come back to the issue of uh, the role of multinationals in China. Um, there have been some comments of uh, multinational companies who fe we, which feel that the investment climate has deteriorated. And um, my question would be, is this based on wrong information or the recent legislation concerning internal procurement and also indigenous innovation, was it in some way misunderstood? Wen Zongli, my second question is related to the relationship between multinationals and China. Recently, China's economic situation is being 这种观点是基于信息的错误呢，还是基于他们误解了中国政府相继出台的有关政府采购和自主创新的有关文件呢 ？Should say, 
外国企业在中国投资的增长，已经说明外国企业对中国的信心并没有失去。但是最近议论比较多的是关于自主创新、知识产权和政府采购这个问题。不完全是外国公司的误解，同我们政策不够明确也有关。There has been some uh, debate recently surrounding indigenous innovation, intellectual property rights, and government procurement in China. It's not all about the misunderstanding of foreign businesses concerning those documents adopted by the Chinese government. It has also something to do with the not so clearly defined policies on our part. 其实这个问题，我方才已经回答清楚了。最关键的是后边两句话。一句话是，所有在中国的外资企业都享受有国民待遇。第二句话，就是在自主创新、政府采购。和知识产权保护上，我们将一视同仁、平等对待。I think I have made our policies very clear in my speech. That is, all foreign businesses established according to law in China will receive national treatment, and in indigenous innovation, government procurement, and protection of intellectual property rights, all businesses. Chinese invested and foreign invested companies in China alike will be treated as equals. We will complete the necessary regulations and rules. We will participate in international trade agreements. We will improve the relevant laws and regulations, and we will continue to take an active part in the government procurement agreement. I think the foreign investors here appreciate very much this response. Premier, if you may allow me a last question. The International Energy Agency just um, mentioned that China has overtaken now the United States to become the largest energy consumer in the world. With the strong economic development, how do you see, you, you mentioned in your speech, the need of uh, energy efficiency, of resource efficiency, but in the long term, and I'm speaking really more about the long term, how can you balance out the needs which you have in energy and energy availability? So, I think that the whole company and the foreign companies will be very happy to answer your question. I want to ask you the last question. A few years ago, the United States Energy Council announced that China has already exceeded the world's largest energy consumption in the world. 您在演讲中也特别指出，中国要进一步努力提高能源和资源的利用效率。我的问题是：从长期而言，中国政府将采取什么措施来平衡能源的供应与能源的消耗之间的关系呢？施瓦布先生提议的问题，确实点中了要害。中国能源的需求增长很快。这同中国这个发展阶段有关，但是必须引起我们高度的重视。在这里，我不想强调两个问题：一个是历史上
发达国家经过两百年到三百年形成的工业化，我们才用了几十年的时间。另一个是人均能源的消费水平，我们只及美国的五分之一 ，OECD 的三分之一。Professor Schwab, you asked a very important question. It is true that China's demand for energy has been rising at a fast speed. This has to do with the current stage of China's development. And it is an issue that we must take very seriously. In the 200 to 300 years of industrialization, the, well, it takes the Western countries about 200 to 300 years to complete their industrialization process. Yet the industrialization process in China has only been going for about a few decades. Secondly, the per capita energy consumption in China is only one-fifth of that of the United States and one-third of the OECD countries. Yet I have no intention to overstress these two above-mentioned po points here. 当我们在这个光明的大厅开会的时候，我们有许多山区还没有电。山区的有些农民常年取暖要烧柴火。我想现在强调的是我们的问题。我们确实这些年发展的高耗能，啊，高污染。这些企业过多了，应当加以抑制。Uh, as we meet in this brightly lit hall, electricity has yet to be extended to a lot of uh, mountainous areas in China, and farmers living in those remote areas still need to burn firewood to meet their heat needs. Here, I want to put more stress, rather, on the challenges that China faces, including the overdevelopment of some energy-intensive industries in the past few years. China must go the road of renewable energy. China's development must be highly focused on renewable energy and climate. This should be our firm stance. China must stay committed to energy conservation, and in pursuing its development, it should always give high priority to energy conservation and environmental protection. That should be our unwavering policy. Inflation, 发展具有节能、环保，又有创新和高附加值的产品，这样才能使我们的企业和经济走上可持续发展的道路。The most important way in meeting China's rising demand for energy. Is to make adjustments in China's economic structure. It is to vigorously develop those energy saving and environment friendly products with a high innovative content and um, a high added value. That is the only way that we can put our businesses and the entire Chinese economy on the track towards sustainable development. In I想补充一下您提的第一个问题。我们在产业发展当中，要注重啊新能源和新材料的发展。这就在于减少哎现有能源的消耗。
I also want to add a comment in response to your first question, Mr. Professor. That is, in pursuing the development of our industries, we will pay close attention to the development of new energies and new materials that will help us cut the current level of energy consumption. So, to address the lack of uh, sustainability, balance, and coordination in China's economic development, our biggest challenge remains those related to China's population, resources, and the environment. We have uh, been fully aware of uh, these challenges, and that, that is why we have uh, put forward the tasks of transforming our economic development pattern and restructuring the Chinese economy. These are objectives of fundamental importance. Thank you. Premier Wen Chabao, you have shared with us the challenges of China. But uh, listening to your speech and to your answers to my questions, you have also shown that China is tackling those challenges in a very comprehensive, foresighted, and systemic way. I also feel confident that China, based on the policies which you outlined, will continue on a fast growth path, but at the same time pursuing a policy which is socially more inclusive and which also addresses the question of energy efficiency of resource efficiency, as particularly your last comment has shown us. I also feel that through these policies, you do a great contribution to the world, because the world needs confidence restored into its future. And a growing China, I think, is a very important factor for recreating the necessary confidence level which we need to look forward to a brighter future. Premier Wen Chabao, we thank you again for having honored us with your presence at this fourth annual meeting, and we are looking already forward to the next year.